bitches Wait, did you say tsunamis bad bitches? That's the official hashtag if you missed it To celebrate times return to television Yeah, tsunamis bad bitches Wait, did you say tsunamis bad bitches? That's the official hashtag if you missed it To celebrate times return to television Welcome to the anime action fan sanctuary With Tom providing that slick commentary The other king of television besides Mary Full of new shows and classics on the itinerary Television is back to being good Now that tsunamis being broadcast in every neighborhood Hey there anime fans, welcome to the first video of Otakon. I don't know if you can look at me and see it. Well, first I'm with the great Charles Dunbar. Otakon, Otakon. Uh, I look ragged because this is my first Otakon and I thought, oh, I won't be overwhelmed. Oh no, your first Otakon is going to kick your ass up oh. one side of the street and down the other, usually while you're waiting in line, mm -hmm. up one side of the street and down the well, other. Well, well. I didn't have that because I had press, which made everybody want to kick my ass. Up they... one side of the street and down the other. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't so, have that problem either. I just died, died panels, lines, skip out. When I was up out, it took me more time to get the kill a kill panel from my phone to my computer than to get from the line to the reg. Yeah. People are calling this line con. Uh, but... Now, line con will forever be anime Boston 2008. <laughs> because if you have to wait in line four hours, it does not pale in waiting in line for ten. Ten on Saturday. Uh, I have been corrected, but you know. that's why <laughs> I was glad I was not part of MyCon. I got my badge that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to start off this video. I thought we finished the questions. We didn't get to it. Anime next. So the next question, you know, we finished off talking about whether or the Japanese companies got it, and um, I remember Gerard said, "Was Gerard or Gerald. Uh, it, it, or Daryl?" It was Daryl's. As I said before, and remember, I am horrible with names. <laughs> well, one of them is big in Austria, and the other is not. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they're just pronouncing names. It, it's it's my gimmick. It's like John Cena's "You can't see me." It's my "You can't see me," except that I can't say your name. Uh, but you, know, he, he had meant something. I was going to segue to the next question, which is why can't Harriman Edgy get more respect in this country? <laughs> Uh, uh, I think Harem gets enough respect. I watched Love Hina. I watched Orange High School Host Club. I've wa well, I haven't watched, but I've read bits of Nicki Moss. So I would think that Harem gets plenty of respect in this country. Etchy, I don't want to touch on the temple. <laughs> Etchy is not my thing. But like Harem gets enough respect because if you coax the Harem, like Love Hina was great because it was Harem, but it was funny. That's important. <laughs> Oren was Oren was great because it was harem, but ha but like half the characters were idiots, yeah. so that worked. And it had Vic, Vic Mignogna in it, and anything he's in is going to get a lot of, of airplay because it's Vic Mignogna. Uh, Negima again, I know it's got wizards, and if Harry Potter shows us a track record, it's that you put a wizard in it, it'll work. Look at what I did for Lord of the Rings. No, let's not compare it because Negi, Negi would kick Harry's ass up and down the street. Maybe. One's, a, one's an Onmyoji, the other is is a whatever the hell those characters from Harry Potter are. And I, I, I don't know, uh, do you think Negi could kill Voldemort? I don't think so. And, and have you seen his final Super Saiyan form? Well, Negi is an Onmyoji, and Onmyoji are good with dealing with ghosts. So, <laughs> it's always possible. It is always possible. And I guess what, especially... In these days, like for instance, every time a new season comes out, I can't read the Anime News Network reviews of the edgy titles because it's always the same type yeah. of thing and over and over. Which is, I guess, hard for me you as want, an edgy fan. Yeah, you want to. I, I, I don't. Edgy is just like I. I've looked at it. I'm, I'm just no. <laughs> yeah, edgy and, and like a lot of moe. I'm the same way about. I'm just not. I don't feel it. It shows like. I don't want my cute girls to just do cute things. I want my cute girls to, like, you know, have purpose in doing their cute things, like Sasami Sonic on Bar and I, where it's Tamatarasu! I mean, That's kind of cool. And Yarlko san, only because, like, it's Yarlko Tep is, like, a schoolgirl beating you up with a crowbar. I mean, to be fair, it's like, my favorite etchies are, like, High School DXD, which, you know, mixes etchy with action, good action. Um, but, you know, that actually brings up a good question, is what are the quintessential animes for you? For me? Well, I mean, quintessentialism is the one like an anime canon, because I firmly believe that there is no such thing as an anime canon anymore. <laughs> but if people were who came up to me and said, I have never seen anime before, 
what should I watch? I always recommend uh, Cowboy Bebop because it just makes sense. I will frequently recommend something like Love Hina or uh, Beck Mongolian Chop Squad. Mostly, like, Love Hina works because it's funny. And even though it's a harem anime, it is a lot of fun and you'll laugh your ass off. Beck only because there's enough hidden references to American music in there that you will, you'll enjoy yourself regardless. Uh, I mean, Full Metal Alchemist is pretty pretty important. People need to know Full Metal Alchemist. You need to be aware of what it is. And then that little annoying kid with the blonde hair and the red jacket suddenly makes a ton more sense. Uh, <laughs> Dragon Ball, I mean, Akira, some of the Miyazaki films. I mean, it's hard to pick essential. Well, on that question... You know, it brings up a bigger thing. What are sort of the big series that you think are people are not seeing enough of? Outlaw Star. <laughs> Seriously, Outlaw Star. I love that show. That show is one of the shows that really got me into anime. Roroni Kenshin, another one of those shows that got me into anime. And admittedly, the anime is nowhere as good as the manga, but it's another one of those shows that's big. It went on for a long time. It had a lot of respect in Japan. I mean, during my Kill Kill Pound today, I accessed the crowd. We are knows Meiji Japan, the Bakamatsu, and like half the audience was here. I'm like, oh, so we've all seen a Rumi Kenshin. Excellent, excellently done. But like, that's one that could totally use some more love. Uh, Gundam doesn't get as much love as it should anymore. Gundam, it's not like Gundam ever got like all the love. I mean, Gundam Wing got a lot of love. But then Seed came out, and Seed was just so like niche, even though it was not. I loved Seed. Seed is like my favorite Gundam, Gundam side story. It's probably my favorite Gundam story, period. Yeah. Uh, Gundam doesn't get enough love. Um, I don't know. I mean, everyone's got that got one of those shows that's like, oh my god, I love this show. And then you ask people, hey, have you seen Psycho Pass? What? Have you seen Psycho Pass? What's that? It's a Philip K. Dick jizzed all over an anime. <laughs> to which next response is, who's Philip K. Dick? Okay, I'm not talking to you. Uh, no, but... I mean, there's a lot of shows that don't get enough respect in this country, and that's it's, not, it's the downside to it. But really, what are you, what are you going to do? Well, it's the downside of you know you have the mainstream, and they follow the, you know, they follow the shonen, and they follow the big popular titles. I mean, I guess that's why I like Toonami right now, is because like at least deep at night, they are starting to show more, more. I guess. I'm just going to go out and say it because it's this is hardly considered to be a controversial opinion, but. For the love of God, One Piece, One Piece, One Piece. That show is amazing. And you can pick it up anywhere, and you will always know what's going on. And it, that's why... There's a long-running Shonen show that knows what it's doing. It's not like Bleach, where after like the first episode, you get filler for an entire season. It's not like Naruto, where I don't give a crap. With One Piece, you at least are having fun. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that's interesting, especially the anime next, your panel on Kill a Kill was so amazing... And, you know, we'd actually been tweeting back and forth, and, you know, we did a tweet about Gurren Lug, and maybe think about this question for you is, why as fans are we so obsessed with Gynex? Because Gynex is insane. <laughs> I mean, look at it this way. You got Trigger, and Trigger is insane. Gurren Lagan is insane. It's colorful, it's edgy, it's got good music, it's got cool, cool characters. They can tell a story. Kill a Kill, great characters, they can tell a story. Inferno Cop, great characters, they can tell a story. I'm looking forward to, uh, Daryl showed a clip for, uh, was it Ninja Slayer, which comes out next year that Trigger's doing. Again, they know how to tell a good story. With other Gynax shows, I mean, when you ask people about Gynax shows, they'll always say Evangelion. Someone might bring up Magical Shopping or Kata Benobashi. Uh, someone might bring up things like that, but it's like, Evangelion, you're watching a guy have a nervous breakdown on screen through animation, and that's kind of cool. But one of the things that they do is uh, they like to send up the genre really well. Evangelion was a send up, a complete reductio ad absurdum for uh, mecha shows. Gynax, I mean, with a Gurren Lagann was a reductio ad absurdum for also for mecha shows, but also for shonen mecha shows, shonen shows. Uh, Kill a Kill is is like Madoka is a lovely reductio ad absurdum for uh, for magical girl shows and also female like like shoujo shows. So the Gynex, like the, the minds and the brains behind Gynex are really good at pushing the canon to its limits and then destroying it. And precious few content creators do that. Like I I watched Inferno Cop after Anex and Inferno Cop worked because Inferno Cop was doing it to the buddy cop formula which is something that we all know. We've all seen buddy cop shows. 
We've all seen Pulp Fiction by this point, and I'm sure some of the people who like Japanese media have gone out there and seen Stray Dog, which was a buddy, like the progenitor of the buddy cop genre. Kurosawa Stray Dog. And Inferno Cop just sends it up. They don't have a problem like co-opting and completely destroying genre. And I love that because it shows you're not afraid. Some people are too afraid and they're too genre conscious. And Gynax and Trigger are most assuredly not. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, and you were talking about that yesterday. I got a preview of his Grimdark panel. My Grimdark panel. The 10 I, minute, what was it, 10 or 15 minute? I did a 15 minute version <laughs> of, a, of an hour long panel. I touched on all the major points. <laughs> So, but yeah, you know, I, you know, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think, uh, like, for instance, I have my issues with Gurren Lagann, but that comes more from the fact that I care more, maybe, than just me about getting more in, emotionally involved with the characters. And I don't feel yeah. that as much with Gurren Lagann, as much as I do with Kill a Kill. Gurren Lagann doesn't have a whole lot of character development. When you think about it, um, Kamen has got some character development, and Simon's got some character development. Yoko doesn't have any character development. I mean, you see Yoko, then you see Yomako, and then what? And everyone she kisses dies. <laughs> Nia's got some character development. <laughs> Spiral Emperor gets some good character yeah. development. He really does. It's been a while, though, since I've watched Girl and the uh, One of my friends had the DVD, had my DVDs for about five years, and then he just recently found them. <laughs> so, uh, I... Well, I, lucky I, you, they're going to be on Toonami now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what, lucky me, I would love to just get the last volume in dub because I have the first two dub volumes and one sub volume, and it gets very jarring when you're used to the voice acting and then it goes straight to the dub. But I digress. Uh, Gurren Lagann was all about all about like shonen shows, which are known for having a lack of character development. So if Gurren Lagann is going to make fun of the shonen shows, it, you don't need the character development. It's a shonen show, mm. and it's a short shonen show. <laughs> I mean, how many episodes of One Piece did we go through before we learned that Luffy had personality? What, like 50? <laughs> That's twice the length of Gurren Lagann. Well, I'll, I'll have to concede those points. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> now, now contrast this with a shoujo show, which is all about getting to know your characters. You understand every single one of, of like Usagi's eccentricities within 10 minutes of watching Sailor Moon because they just throw it at you. <laughs> well, Charles, thank you for... Oh, we're not going to finish this. Oh, we're... Well, there's more questions on there. We there's got more questions, but you know, you, you just mentioned Usnagi, and unfortunately, I have a noose around my neck. And if I don't cover the Sailor Moon press conference, I have a couple girls who are gonna hang me up by that tower over there. Damn, that's a nice tower, though. <laughs> it, they'll ha they'll throw you off the top of the Lupin building. <laughs> yes, there's a Lupin building right next to a bank, and it's green lettering. Oh, you know something's going on. Going on. <laughs> No, well, definitely, because I'm definitely going to have to try to bring you on for Evangelion, the review Evangelion, Kill a Kill, and Gurlog, and we'll do a whole month of that. I don't know if I want to touch Ava anymore. Uh, <laughs> I've had fun with Ava. I have been do I did Ava back when I started doing panels, and oh, that was fun. Gurren Lagan, I'd love to talk about it. It'll give me an excuse to watch it again. It's been a while. Yeah. So, anime fans, thank you for watching this, and we'll be back with another riff interview. Hey there, it's Anime Generation. I'm here with David Williams at Section 23, and he's going to tell us about all the new fantastic things that are coming up from Section 23. So, David, what great things are coming from Section 23? Well, we've got a lot of great stuff that's coming out right now. We uh, just, right here at the convention here at Otakon, we brought out early... Otakon! Otakon, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, we've released early. We've got uh, lots of Mote. This has come out on Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, we've got... Uh, short piece that's come out 
Next in Early Generation. Yes, there's another interview here at Otacon. I am, of course, your host, Thomas Primetime Madison. I'm here with the legendary Tony Oliver. And thank God, finally, somebody's name I can actually pronounce. And not, <laughs> it's a running gag. I mess up everybody's name. Uh, <laughs> thank God you have two first names. Well, actually, it's Tony. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good night, everybody. So we are here at Otacon. We are having a blast. You know, Actually, it's my first Otacon, so, you know, I thought I had experienced cons before. <laughs> it's a big con. It is a big con. So, but thank you for being here with us for a moment. So, the first question I'm going to ask you is probably an obvious one that you get asked all the time. And, uh, you know, what is it you feel that Robotech is not very good? Because you played the legendary yeah. Rick Hunter, which is like in anime lore. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty lucky on that one. Um, I uh, no with Robotech. Uh, without Robotech, I don't have a career. I mean, Robotech is really uh, looking back is really where my career started. I mean, I was acting before that, and I had little bits here and little things there. I did some stage work and occasional bit part in the movie. But to achieve the uh, full time, where people understood what I did and wanted me to do it, that Robotech is where that started. And what's extraordinary about it is that I had never done a series before. So Carl, the the producer, Carl Masek, um Really took a chance. I was a really untried actor, and he let me play this wonderful role, and uh, it's it started everything. It started everything. And, and to bounce off that, what do you think was the unique thing that you gave Rick Hunter that made it so unique? I think part of it's because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so no, really, because if you it, 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 back in that day, to me, a voice actor was Mel Blanc. Somebody's doing really weird cartoony voices, and here I have to act this very real part. <clears throat> and I think the fact that I just was so out of my element that I really couldn't think too much and just, just act. And I think that's really what, what I was able to bring to it. The character itself is wonderful. I think anybody playing that character would have, it would have found the same success. Well, you know, next question. Uh, you know, we're not going to say that you're old, but you, you're a seasoned voice actor. I'm a seasoned voice, voice actor. Seasoned yes. voice actor. He's not old. He's a seasoned voice actor. So you, but you've pretty much been as it started to rise. So for you, what do you feel has changed the most since uh, you started voice acting to now? Uh, the fandom. The, the, the fandom when I first started, uh, uh, you know, Robotech aside, because Robotech was what really started this, this mainstreaming. But the fandom has expanded. When I first started, it, was, it, was, it really was that stereotype. The, you know, the socially inept guy sitting in the basement watching Japanese VHS tapes. I mean, that, was the, that was the stereotype. And over the years, it's, it has expanded, has become more mainstream. And, and uh, first, suddenly, after a while, for the first time, you start seeing a lot more women at the, at the conventions. And then the conventions, suddenly lots of ethnicities started showing up. So at first, I mean, literally, they were, they were all white guys. <laughs> and now every kind of human being is coming to this. And I think it's wonderful. It's really become a, a, a mainstream social event rather than, than just a, you know, a geek fest, essentially. <laughs> and for the business side of voice acting, how has that changed? Well, the more audience, the more work there is. And the more work there is, the more I get to do what I do. So uh, I'm all for it. <laughs> well, but I'm also talking about, like, you know, with the influx of new voice actors. You know, there, oh, you know, there are people that you know, wouldn't have done voice acting, I think, 20 years ago that now see it as a career. Well, yeah, and well, it is now, or it wasn't back then. And also, another thing that's happened is there's an, when I started, nobody, you know, I, I'd never seen, I, I had seen it, and I didn't know it. You know, because I grew up with Kim uh, and, Gigantor and things like that, um, but the, the we, there's an entire generation of actors that are now kind of leading the charge in the in the industry that all grew up watching anime. They were fans before they were actors. So you get people like Yuri Lowenthal, who he gets he got to play uh, he got to play a part in Shadow Chronicles, yeah. in Robotech Shadow Chronicles. He was thrilled because he's one of these people who used to run home every day to watch Robotech, and so that it's it's changed. So these people who are doing these actors now know the genre. So they're, they're really good at it. And, and it's, it's wonderful. It's really raised the bar for all of us. Yeah. So the last question, probably your heart, because I, I, I've been asking this question so far at the con. Every voice asks, like, oh my god, that's not an easy question, a fun question. That's a hard, difficult, stressful question. But, you know, it's the Mount Rushmore question, which is, you know, if they made a Mount Rushmore of voice actors, who would the four be? Like, for instance, for me, it's Mel Blanc, Scott McNeil, Jim Cummings, and Steve Lowe. Mm -hmm. So what would your Mount Rushmore voice actors be? Wow, that is a tough question. Well, Mel Blanc, of course. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, Steve Bloom yeah. is up there. Kari Walker, she's unbelievably good. Um, wow. I don't know the fourth one. There's so many good people. Uh, where's the Marsh? 
Ron Paul? <laughs> not Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron, Ron Paul. <laughs> Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I am not with him. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, when he's not running for president, he's a voiceover. Yeah. <laughs> He, he does the coyote fall yes, as yes, he's in the rubber motor cartoons. <laughs> it's still morning, guys. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Tony. Right. It's been a blast, and thank you for coming on the show for a little bit. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. And to Nami Generation, I will be back with another interview in just a second. Anime fans, yes, you're awesome. Absolution Pilot, Thomas Primetime Madness, here with our Game Industry interview. We're here with Justin Cross. You know her from you know, Faye Valentine, Hari. Oh wait, no, I got, I gotta pull this out. I haven't pulled it out since. I haven't pulled it out what since. What are you gonna Metro. pull out? No, no. I'm gonna pull up the Scott McNeil list. Oh great, we're gonna be here until next Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, done so many wonderful things, and she's gonna have some time with us to you know talk about her career. So, first question: I was requested at gunpoint to ask this. Oh my. So. Uh, he, the, the request is they want you to uh, ask you about uh, apparently doing the Fembots in Austin Powers. Oh, you remember? That's so awesome. Psh, psh, psh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that experience like? I thought the first Austin Powers film was the funniest and I just loved it so much. It was so wrong and so many kinds of wrong. I just loved it. And um, being able to do, I did a number of incidentals in a Wallop group on that. I just happened to be lucky enough that I uh, was in on that session. And um, I ended up being the narrative voice as he comes out of the cryogenic state. Warm liquid goo phase now beginning. And, um, and he has to make an evacuation that takes forever. So I just thought the humor was just so great. So irreverent, so funny. Mike Myers at his best, yeah. So the next question is, you, you, you're you seasoned at this point. Why, thank you're you. Seasoned. That was delicate. <laughs> yes. I did the same thing with Tony. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he appreciated it equally, yes. <laughs> so, but what in your past and your training do you feel has helped you become so successful as a voice actor? Oh, gosh, I don't feel so successful. Isn't that funny? Um, 
I'm still I'm still growing and learning and expanding and petitioning and, and trying to land more and more roles but um, I think because I'm always challenged in what I do it keeps it fresh and interesting and engaging and um, challenging I um, I think because I am such I have such an eye for character study I'm constantly examining and observing the human condition and collecting traits and uh, nuances and you know adding to my bag of tricks of voices all the time I'm sort of hell-bent on always finding new voices digging deep and um, I would like to think that I'm a solid actress and that I have deep roots and acting chops that I pull from um, I you know I really just want to be able to produce great quality work. And I think um, having a lot of diversity in many different characters has given me great opportunities to hone that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, with that being said, is what type of characters do you like to play in the booth? Um, you know, you pull, you, they have you, you know, there's Google Sue, there's Faye Valentine, you run the gambit. That's the challenge. That's that's the goal, not to be typed, mm -hmm. not to be stuck in just one niche of um, voice type. I, a lot of actresses complain about feeling that they are typed out, and I really am determined not to wiggle loose of any kind of trappings of being typed. So I'm looking for, I call myself a passionista, I'm looking for the most passionate aspects of life. I want high drama and high comedy, so I want big, you know, funky, f uh, ugly pratfalls, and I want, you know, rich, deep, emotional crying scenes, you know, I, everything in between. I mean, I just love being an actor and conveying the human condition. Uh, that's what, well, speaking of the comedy, you know, you've done, you've done pretty much everything behind the scenes. So, what are some of your favorite funny stories in the booth or behind the scenes? I don't have a lot of them, you know, uh, ironically, as glamorous and fun and exciting as our as our work seems, it's it's very not glamorous. It's very unglamorous. It's um, we are pressured. We have a lot of high pressure to have a tremendous amount of outcome per hour in a very efficient short amount of time. So we have to deliver very quickly. And um, post production always has a small budget. Once a, a title is complete, there's no money left. So everything is done very very cheap <laughs> and there's a better way to say that very affordably so economically let's say restart everything's done very economically so um, I guess it just say rephrase your question again well basically you know because I know voice actors and actresses they'll like you they'll leave I guess bo uh, voice bombs to where they say something oh, funny for yeah. the you know, voice actors. oh our outtakes yeah our our outtakes. oh no we're, we're we kind of have a competition going in different environments with different shows and different combinations of people to see who can out funny each other so <laughs> lots of racy dirty senses of humor are uh, rampant in my sessions <laughs> guilty um, but really one of the wildest things that's ever happened oh that's what I was getting at um, we we actually have to be super disciplined and have high output, but at the same time we're creative people, so we're always being irreverent and you know doing what's completely inappropriate with a, a character. So the more innocent they are, the more we corrupt them behind the scenes. It's terrible, but um, it's quite funny. <laughs> but one of the funniest things that, that ever happened in studio for me is I was directing someone who was new, and in the dialogue you can see within parentheses describing the action or giving the actor any hints as to what's going on. And in one of the scenes that this guy was auditioning for me for, it said something about he had a falling reaction and he had an impact and then a groan. And I was explaining how this was gonna go. We previewed the footage. I told him how it was gonna basically play out. And now, now we're gonna go ahead and shoot one. Here we go. And in the corner of my eye, I saw feet flying up in the air. And this guy just got up and fell and created this physical thing instead of just voice acting it. So that was pretty hysterical. And I felt so bad for him because it was, you know, one of his first experiences in studio. It's like, okay, all that is what not to do. <laughs> really, acting is just a lot easier. Yes. That's why it's so. That's why voice acting is so hard. It is hard. Yes. So our final question for you is: We're asking all of the actors and actresses at Autocon, and that is, uh, what would be your Mount Rushmore of voice acting? If they built a Mount Rushmore of voice acting tomorrow, what would be the four heads? Like for me, it's Mel Blanc, Scott McNeil, Steve Bloom, and Jim Cummings. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Now let's include some women. June Foray. <laughs> um, gosh, how oh, you know? 
at times, like, I don't know. God, I haven't added that many women, have I? Um, yeah, I just, I, it, June is a big one for me because I grew up on Fractured Fairy Tales and, you know, Warner Brothers and, um, and Hanna-Barbera. So I think it's important to include some of the classics, but yeah, yeah. Yes yeah. to all of those. Wow. <laughs> And obviously, you'd, you'd be, or at least you'd be in close competition there with all the work you've done because you, you're now a recent already. You're now, like, what, you have the most voice acting credits, at least in America? English, in, yes. English, right, English. right. American, yeah. Which, wow, to beat Scott. I, I, because I know Scott has tons. It's like, when I make the joke of, we're going to be here until next Christmas, we're not joking. <laughs> Get out your jingle bells. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. So, but thank you for taking thank some time for, you know, it. It's been a long day for her, <laughs> so thank you for staying with us, and you know, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time. Absolutely, thank you so much, and thank you for your support. And see you, Space Cowboys. <laughs> and we'll be back with another interview. Tsunami's back, bitches. Wait, did you say Tsunami's back, bitches? That's the official hashtag if you missed it to celebrate Tom's return to television. Yeah, Tsunami's back, bitches. Wait, did you say Tsunami's back, bitches? That's the official hashtag if you missed it to celebrate Tom's return to television. Welcome to the anime action fan sanctuary with Tom providing that slick commentary. The other king of television besides Mary, full of new shows and classics on the itinerary. Television is back to being good. Now that Tsunami's being broadcast in every